Hi, I'm Peter Jones, Chartered Surveyor, Author and Property Investor, and this is the Progressive Property Podcast. And today I'm delighted to welcome back to the studio, Chris Hector. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How are you doing? Very good. Good. Chris came in a few weeks ago and talked to us all about fire regulations and electrical systems. And I thought it'd be really good and very useful to have a follow-up session because there's much, much more that we need to know before we start refurbishing, renovating and developing properties. So Chris, let's cut straight to the chase here. Refurbishing properties is quite a big subject. There's a lot of legislation involved. We're going to pick through that. I'm sure that most people listening to this will probably realise that as landlords we need gas safety certificates, electrical safety certificates. But what else do we need to be thinking about from a legal standpoint? Well, obviously, when you're doing a refurb, you need to conform to the building regulations. That's sort of a given. But there's some bits which people may not be aware of. In particular, there's something called the Construction Design and Maintenance Regulations, which have changed in 2015, which now apply. So it's important those are stick to, stuck to. But also, um, legal, Legionella risk assessments need to be done, and your portal portable appliances need to be tested. Okay, so the, the construction management and... Con construction design and management. management. There we are, a bit of a mouthful. Is this the CDM thing which I hear about from yes. time to yes, time? Yes, that's right. Yeah, now it'd be really good to actually sort of pick into that in some detail because I remember a few months ago I was talking to somebody and they just casually mentioned the CDM regulations as if everybody knows about this stuff. But it seems to have sort of come in, as far as I'm concerned, slightly under the radar, but it's something which affects all of us, I imagine. So let, let's start at the very beginning. What, what are the CDM regulations, Chris? Well, there are a set of regulations that should be adhered to for every construction project, no matter what property or size of a project there is. Um, so that makes it really important. It defines what needs to be done to comply to and secure health and safety in that construction project. Right, now we're getting very technical and there's a temptation maybe that if you've just sort of switched onto this podcast you might think, oh this is technical stuff, I'm not sure I'm really interested, might go and listen to Radio 1. Don't do that, <laughs> don't do that because this is absolutely fundamental to everything we do, isn't it Chris? It is indeed, I mean it is a law that you need to, need to abide by and in 2015 they changed the regulations and pulled in or put in a new paragraph saying that if you are working in a domestic property, um, this regulation now applies to you unless it's your own property or one of your family members. And it specifically mentions landlords in guidance note seven. <laughs> right. That you've got to comply to this. And if you don't comply to it, you could be in trouble. Right, okay, so let's just take a breath there and let that resonate. So the CDM regulations apply to every project, no matter how big, no matter how small, mm -hmm. So if I'm doing a simple basic refurb, for example, if I'm doing a classic BRR type model refurb, which we talk about on, on Masterclass, where perhaps it's a bathroom, kitchen, lick of paint and some new carpets, do the CDM regs apply? Yes. Really? Yeah. Because it seems like it's a sort of trifling little refurb, but mm. it really does apply. Well, I suppose in terms of health and safety, in the, those works, you've got to look at what could go wrong. Okay. Obviously, as soon as you start manipulating the, the building, you, you've got a bit of a problem. As soon as you start using substances that are hazardous to health, you've got a bit of a problem that it should be managed properly. Right. So what, what would be a sort of definition of something that's going to be hazardous to health? Well, paint. Okay. Something <laughs> as simple as that. Something as simple as that. Right. So whichever way we look at it, no matter how small your refurb, the CDM regs apply. Yeah. And I think this is the thing which I was a little bit surprised about when I heard about this because it was like a throwaway comment. And the trouble is, if you don't know what you don't know, then you don't know it. And it was one of those instances where, as the property expert, it actually I came across something which I didn't know. So hopefully this podcast is going to inform everybody of what they need to know before they get out their paintbrushes even and start putting the paint on. This applies to everything, even the smallest refurb. So I just wanted to really labour the point so that, it, so that we all understand we need to know this stuff. So Chris, let's just think about what this means. Guidance Note 7 says that it applies to all domestic properties. Um, it, well, the CDM regs apply to 
all properties. Okay. Um, the CDM regs don't really supply, apply so much to domestic clients. That means you're refurbing your own property or family member. So if it's your own fa home or a family member. Yeah, because by default, the responsibility for health and safety falls on the contractor in okay. those instances. Okay. If, it's not, if you're not a domestic client, which landlords aren't, the onus of responsibility for health and safety falls on you. Right, so we keep saying landlord, but what if it's the property which you haven't yet let out, but you're right. just doing a refurb? It'll fall on the property investor. For, okay. Or the property owner. Or the property owner, yeah. Okay. So just to clarify, if it's your own home, it doesn't apply. If it's the home of a family member who you're presumably helping out by helping them paint their house, mm. it doesn't apply. That but how, how do they define family member, though? That's, that's not quite right. The, okay. the regulations always apply. Right. The responsibility for health and safety doesn't apply to a domestic client. It de defaults to the contractor. Right. Okay. So very good clarification. The regs apply in every instance, but we're talking about who's responsible. Mm. Okay, I get that. Okay, fantastic. Why do we need to know this stuff though? What, what, what are the regulations actually trying to prevent or encourage? Well, the main thing they're trying to uh, ensure is that the people working on the project and the people living in that building afterwards are safe. That's the main thing it's trying to do. Um, it also uh, ensures that the project's well managed and well run, and that sometimes can mean that you don't have unexpected costs or un unexpected delays. So it's trying to put a management structure into the project to ensure that people are s uh, safe and the project's safe when it's finished, and that um, you don't have any unexpected costs and it runs on time. Okay, so our listeners are primarily going to be investors. We might be doing single let buy to lets, we might be doing HMOs, we might be doing serviced accommodation, we might be doing bigger projects like commercial conversions. CDM regulations apply to all of these. Mm -hmm. So what kind of things do we need to know? What, what is it that property investors need to do to comply to these regulations, Chris? Well, um, I'm, I'm, one of the most important things is, is to do with duty holders, and that sounds a bit technical, but it's just who's got responsibility for uh, safety in, in that project. So obviously the property owner is one of the main duty holders. You then have something called the principal designer, which all sounds a bit technical, the principal contractor, then designers, contractors and workers. Okay, well take, a, take, take <laughs> us through this then, nice and slowly so we can all begin to understand where we actually fit within this sort of pecking order and chain of responsibility. I'll, I'll start with workers. So okay. workers haven't got a lot of responsibility, but if they see something that's unsafe, they're duty bound to inform people that there's an unsafe situation that's occurred. So just to be absolutely clear, a worker is anybody who's working on the property but isn't an owner? Yep, indeed. Uh, then you have contractors who would employ workers. Um, the principal contractor, who's the main one taking control of health and safety on the site. Designers and principal designers who'll design the health and safety system and obviously the property before it, um, it st the refurb started. So. Um, I'll talk about the principal designer. Their job is to identify and elim eliminate and control foreseeable risks. Um, so they're kind of doing a pre-construction analysis of what we need to put in place to make sure it's nice and safe. The, the principal contractors then got to plan, manage, monitor and coordinate the health and safety during the construction phase. Um, he's got other duties as well which include providing a suitable site induction and uh, managing welfare, making sure welfare facilities are provided. Now, this is a particular bugbear of mine, the welfare bit, because I've been to a number of projects where the, the property investor has gone, right, we're replacing all the toilets and all the, those, and removes the lot. And although I, it's a bit of a delicate matter, what do you think the workers do when there's nowhere to go? <laughs> I hate to think. Well, yes, it's not pleasant. So just as a top tip, always leave a loo, please, property yes. investors. It does make life a bit easier. Yes. Okay, fine. So, just to get, get a, a full understanding of the terms that we're using here, the principal designer. Mm. If I'm doing a basic refurb, kitchen, bathroom, liquor, paint and carpets, who's the principal designer in that instance? Um, well, it could be you. I okay. Um, I, would I had a feeling you might say that. I'd hardly recommend you appoint someone else, perhaps. Um, and when you appoint these people, I didn't mention that you should really do it in writing so that 
it's uh, to ensure that they know that that's their responsibility and if anything went wrong it's clear that it's their responsibility um, so th these titles can be all adopted by one person because you may only have one person on the job or it can be split out if it's a larger project you may split the roles out over, over various different people right just sitting here thinking about the practicalities of this if i was doing a refurb which is a simple refurb kitchen bathroom liquor paint and carpets and I said to my builder, by the way, I'm going to write you a letter making you the principal designer and the principal contractor. Would that A, work in terms of putting the responsibility back onto the contractor, but B, in practice, how is your average builder going to react to that? And would they even understand what you're talking about? It, yes, that depends. <laughs> it mm. does depend. Uh, very greatly. I mean, that's the little bit of a problem we've got at the moment. Most bills will go, what? Because mm. they're used to working in the domestic market. Yeah. Pre-2015, they didn't really have to comply to any of these regulations. Yeah. But it's important from your point of view as the property owner stroke investor that we actually do this and that we do put something in writing. Yeah, well, otherwise you're completely liable for everything. And, you know, I don't like to sort of make comments on today's culture, but there is potentially a bit of a where there's a blame, there's a claim. Yes. So that if anything goes wrong and you haven't d appointed someone else to look after health and safety, you may be um, liable for fulfilling that claim. And if health and safety get hold of it, you might, might even get prosecuted or sent to prison. So it's definitely worth writing a letter, I think. Right. <laughs> and not only worth writing the letter, but I'm, I would also suspect that it's well worth watching to make sure that your contractor is actually doing the kind of stuff they should be doing. Indeed, well that's part of the regulations really, that, that even though you have appointed someone else, you're sp still supposed to check that they're actually doing it, providing a health and safety system, um, having regular site meetings and updates. Okay, well I was going to say, let's, let's, let's move on and start thinking about some of the things that we need to be thinking about for actually managing and, and, and organising the project. So what, what do we need to think about, Chris? Well, in the C CDM regulations, there are a number of high-risk areas which need to be addressed. Now, some of these aren't going to be happening in a standard uh, buy-to-let refurb, but they're covered because it could, these regulations cover huge projects. So I'll just run through, th through them. Well, well, just to stop you there, I mean, it may not be in a buy-to-let, but it could be in a HMO, yeah, for possibly. example, or a bigger, bigger project, or if you're doing a conversion, maybe? Yeah, indeed. Of some kind. Indeed. So yeah. Fall from heights, that's a, a fairly obvious one, yeah. um, and use of ladders needs to be covered. Collapse of excavations, well I'd, hopefully we're not having to excavate anything, but <laughs> perhaps we are. Um, collapse of structures, that's a definite issue in uh, refurbs, particularly in HMOs where you're rejigging things. Um, exposure to building dust and exposure to asbestos, well those are massive ones. I mentioned in the previous talk about the 600 odd electricians that have died in a four year period from exposure to asbestos. And I suppose that's a bit of a passionate mind because people go, oh no, asbestos, oh, I, I don't even want to know it's there. Um, but the, you can get online some very cheap self-test kits for around 60 quid. And once it's identified, if you, have, if you are unlucky to have asbestos in there, there are coping mechanisms. It's not necessarily always to strip everything out and, and uh, clear the whole site up. It might just be a, on one wall, in which case we might just not touch that wall at all and everything would be fine, it would be completely okay to do that. Mm. So knowing if asbestos there is kind of the right, getting the check done is the right thing to do to protect your power team yeah. um, for the future really. Okay. Um, so uh, electricity is obviously a hazard when you're um, refurbing, so um, certainly when I'm working with a team I normally disconnect the whole electrical supply and put a temporary supply in so people haven't got the risk of bashing into a live cable. Mm. Um, and obviously you're supposed to protect members of the public. Okay, just flipping back, obviously as you say asbestos is a passion of yours, well not asbestos but <laughs> protection from asbestos perhaps is a better way of putting it. Building dust, it seems to me that there's, that's an, an inevitable consequence of doing a refurb, there's going to mm. be dust. What, what can we do to manage that then and mitigate problems with building dust? Well it's dead simple really. It's, get an industrial vacuum cleaner rather than using a brush. Yes, <laughs> yes. So that you're sucking it up rather than brushing around and making the situation worse. That's a very simple strategy to cope with that. Right. So I suppose one of the things which I'm beginning to pick up is although the CDM regs themselves could feel 
onerous, a lot of this is going to be common sense. Yeah, indeed. I mean, you know, if you're going to be cutting into brick and brick walls, perhaps if you can use wet cutting uh, tools rather than dry cutting tools, you'll keep the dust down. Yeah. OK, so what else do we need to be thinking about when we're sort of talking about managing the project then, Chris? Well, in terms of being the property owner, you've really got to allow the team adequate time to complete the project. You've got to provide information to the designer and the constructor so they know firstly what to do, obviously. But um, in knowing what to do, they'll be able to design the safety system so that everyone is OK. Um, then keep communicating, because I'm sure you're aware of being a property investor yourself. You can start off with a plan and you discover some nasty in your property which wasn't obvious at the time of, of commencement, and then you need to change hmm. the plan and potentially change the safety systems you're using. Uh, I've mentioned it again. Ensure adequate welfare facilities <laughs> are available. Um, uh, in what, I'm just sorry, I've just read my notes, obviously. No, um, no, no, <laughs> that's fine. So coming back to that, and, and it's a point worth mentioning again, obviously you, you've talked about WC facilities, mm. but presumably things like just having running water on Indeed, site. Indeed, running water. Having well. light, simple, basic things. Yes, indeed, yeah. So that, you know, it's just looking after your team, really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, y you need to keep something called a health and safety file, which we'll come back to in a minute. Uh, and um, you've got to ensure the design is correct, mm. <laughs> obviously. Yes. OK, so, uh, so tell us about the health and safety file. You say uh, we have to keep one. Yes. By, by we, presumably if we've written our letters to the contractor, the contractor's got to keep one. Mm, yes. But well, we need to make sure that they're doing it. There's two main parts of CDA regulations. One is a, a con something called a construction phase plan, and the second is a health and safety file. So is it all right if I speak about a constru construction phase plan first? I think we need to know all about it, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that contains a brief description of what the project is the key dates and the key project members. It's going to list the, manager, the management of the project in terms of health and safety aims, the site rules, uh, cooperation and coordination between workers, um, which is normally done with site meetings, uh, what the site induction is so that people are aware of the risk when they walk into the building and the safety gear they need. Um, I'll put where the, where the welfare facilities are because you're now all going to provide them. Yes. And, um, what the fire and emergency procedures are. And it also lists how you're going to control specific risks. So that's kind of RAMs or something called risk assessments and method statements. So just a little word on that. Risk assessment says we've got a risk here and this is how dangerous it is. Um, and if necessary, we need to apply this method statement, which will negate or reduce that risk. So it's just a, uh, almost like a identifying where the risks are and saying, we're going to work this way so that people aren't at, at risk at all or not at such a great risk. Right. Now, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but I'm just thinking maybe there's a bit of self-interest here because I'm thinking about my projects mm -hmm. and obviously the listeners as well. But if we're doing the basic refurb again, this seems quite a, a, lo a lot of detail if we're just putting in a new kitchen, new bathroom, lick of paint, new carpets. Well, but presumably the contractor's still got to have something which they can produce if an inspector of some kind turned up and asked to see it. Indeed, I mean, there are some great tools online. Um, there's some cheap free tools online which you can use to create risk assessments and method statements. Um, if you pop onto my Facebook page, there'll be some links there of what you can do and what you can get um, very cheaply and freely. Okay, um, so what's your Facebook page? Uh, you, if you just look for Hector's Electrics on Facebook, you'll okay. find me. Okay, so that's cool. My concern is, does your average builder out there who's doing kitchen, bathroom, small refurb, actually know they're meant to be doing this? I would are, we, are we in a position where we should be educating them? I think we probably are. Big responsibility. Mm. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, going on to the health and safety file, because that's just the beginning. That's the construction phase plan. Mm. They also need to be keeping the health and safety file. So, what, what's that all about, Chris? Well, the health and safety file is really a list of what's happened on that project. And it's designed for people who are coming once the project's completed uh, so they understand where um, there is potential risk and what's been done in the past. So it's, it's kind of future-proofing yourself so that if new contractors come in, they're not exposed to potential risks. Um, so it, it gives a brief description of the work that has been carried out. It uh, shows what hazards there were and how the hazards were eliminated or reduced. 
Um, it has some key structural prin principles in there, including safe working loads for floors and ceilings if you've changed them. Um, any hazardous materials used, information regarding removal or dismantling of installed plant machinery, and information about equipment provided for cleaning and maintaining the building if necessary, perhaps not really in, a, in, our, in our property investors' world, but that's quite so important. Um, but also the nature and location of spe uh, specific services. So things like where does the gas main run, where are the electrical cables running, where's the water running, are all really important things. Because if we get a contractor in later and they go and stick a drill in a wall straight through your water pipe, it's going to make a bit of a mess of your building. Even worse if they go through the gas pipe because you could blow the <laughs> blow the house up. Yeah. So it's important that those things are, are in there. And uh, you know, if you're doing a major building, you'd have an as-built drawing there, um, showing exactly how it, the building's been constructed. Right. Okay. So there's obviously quite a lot of work which needs to go into this. Well, it, de it depends on the size of the, size of the project, really. I mean, if you just change the kitchen, the bathroom, and, and put some paint up, then it's probably not a very onerous task. But if you're flattening a building and rebuilding the whole thing, it's going to have to be quite detailed. Yes, indeed. So just to be absolutely clear, though, legally we're obliged to have these. Mm -hmm. If we write to our contractors, legally the contractors are obliged to be producing all of this. Who's going to be checking as to whether we have one? And at what point would the check happen? When would we get the knock on the door? Well, you could get the knock on the door at any time. <laughs> um, although you've appointed your main people, you are still duty bound to check they're actually doing it. Yeah. Um, but officially, you have to notify the HSE executive when you've got more than 30 days of work being performed with 20 workers on site at a time, which isn't going to happen in most of our, mm. most of our um, uh, developments that Progressive are, are involved with, or that you've got more than 500 working days worth of work. Well, again, most of our flips and, and refurbs aren't going to be going over 500 days, or I hope they aren't. No. Um, so you don't have to call the HSE out and tell them you're doing the work. HSE being? A health and safety executive. Okay. Um, but they are free to come and knock on the door and ask to see everything. Right. So to be absolutely clear, we don't have to call them unless there's more than 30 days' work with 20 workers yep. or more than 500 days' worth of work. Mm but we still have to have the documentation we've already mentioned, like the health and safety plan and the construction plan. Yes. I can't remember what that was called, but there was the bit beforehand. That still has to be plan. done. Yeah. Yep. Regardless, that still has to be done, regardless of whether it's a big project or not. I'm labouring the point is that we all know we actually have to be thinking about this. You know, I, I think really it's sort of, to borrow some phrases from Rob Moore, it's a case of, don't get ready, be ready. Yes. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to illustrate a bit of a story from sure. my own, own yeah, past. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of that's course. That's okay. So um, we used to um, deliver and install office furniture throughout the home counties and, and uh, all over the place, really. Before your electrical days? Yes, before my electrical days. And I remember one specific instance. I was on the sales desk and we took all the incoming calls and I got a call from one of our van drivers. Now in those days, phones in vans were something a bit unusual, and some people may remember these old Motorola phones with the push buttons in the handset. Mm. Well, he called me up on one of those and said, Chris, I've got a real problem here. I've just been pulled over by the police into a way station. They've weighed the vehicle and it's overloaded. I said, ah, right, well, what do, right, he's not going to let you go then, obviously, because it's overloaded. Um, so I'll send another, or get another van, got one of the guys out of the warehouse, went in another van, split the load, we'll be fine. Um, about an hour later, I got another phone call saying, we split the load and both vans are still overloaded. Wow. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and we're, we're obviously in a bit of a situation. So we sent a third van and uh, that managed to sort the situation out in terms of being overloaded. And it was a bit of one of those cases that we got a bit enthusiastic with what we're doing and done a bit of another Rob Moore quote. We've done a bit of ready, fire, aim. And we really shouldn't have done that. We should have got ready or been ready first. So. We'd learnt a big lesson there because the police turned up and arrested my brother and he handled it absolutely fantastically. Having had his, you know, the full arrest speech, you have the right to remain whatever, <laughs> um, he said, uh, would you like a cup of tea? At which, time, which point they sat down. We did get fined. But from that, we learnt a massive lesson. We joined the Fleet Transport Association, which is a really good thing to have done if you're 
moving vehicles around and we got way of scales. We changed our computer software to put weights on every product so that we knew how much weight was going onto the vehicle. And that meant we never got fined again. And this CDM stuff's a bit like that. You can, you can charge ahead and do your construction work and it's probably going to be okay. The guys that work probably know how to work safely. But if something does happen, you can be liable and you don't really want to be. And it can be just small things like you pull the uh, floorboard up and the nails are sticking up and someone goes and treads on it. Mm. Now they've got an infected foot and gangrene. Now who's mm. going to be liable? Mm. It's you. And you, know, you, you just don't want to be put in that situation. Mm. And it's usually something small and silly like that which will cause the biggest problems. Mm. Yeah, well, the, the small ones are the ones that are going to happen more regularly. And you know, when people are aware of this as a regulation, you may have some workers who are quite happy to put that claim in against you because there's no health and safety system in place. Yeah. So that's kind of why it's really important. Yeah. Okay. But it does seem like a lot of paperwork, though, Chris. It, what, what, what if we decide, you know what, I just can't be bothered for my kitchen, bathroom, liquor, paint? Well, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, if you are unfortunate enough to get a visit, then they can shut your site down immediately, which is going to cost you money and cause delays because we're all trying to refurb quickly so the properties can either get sold or rented out. Um, you could be subject to um, a legal action from one of your workers um, because it's your fault. If it's really bad, if someone really hurts themselves badly, you could be prosecuted and you could be put into prison. So it's not really a great situation to be in when you're just trying to get a property flipped or rented out. Yeah. And as a practicality, if they did shut down the site, how do you get it opened up again? Well, you've got to correct everything. You've got, you're going to have to put all the mm -hmm. health and safety paperwork in place and correct any issues that, have, that they've found. Right. OK. So when should property investors actually appoint a principal designer then? Well, principal designer should be appointed before any work starts because his job is to look at the design you've got and create the health and safety system before work starts. But that could be the contractor. It could be the contractor. It yeah. probably should. For most of the smaller jobs, it should be the contractor. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So going back to my earlier question, if we go, go back to our contractor and say, by the way, I'm appointing you to be the principal designer, mm. and they go, what? Is there anything on your Facebook page, for example, which we can use to actually educate our builders if, well, they, need to, if they don't understand this stuff? Certainly. If, um, if people just uh, buzz me their email address, I can whiz over the six-page short guide and the full 90 pages wow. of it, if you like. And I'll just whisk that over as a PDF and then you can, um, you can see what needs to be done. You can pass it on to your, cons your, your guys and they can have a quick read. Right. OK. That all sounds sort of quite heavy duty. We need to know about it, though. Mm. And inevitably, at some point in the future, we're going to hear about people who are a little bit flippant, blasé. Unfortunately, those chickens will come home to roost and I'm sure in time we will hear about prosecutions onto this, sadly. Mm. But there we are, we've all been warned, we need to know about this stuff. Now we all know about it, we need to make sure we're doing this. Mm. But when we're doing something even as simple as a simple refurb, there are other things that we need to be thinking about, aren't there, Chris? Well, yeah, um, you've got a duty of care for the people who may um, end up working or living in your property. Um, and that also sort of encapsulates something nasty called Legionella's disease. So, so we're principally thinking now about once we've finished the refurb, we've rented the property out, we've got a tenant going in. Mm. Tell me about this, because this is actually a bit of a bugbear of mine, actually. You don't know this. Oh, no. But uh, it would be interesting to get your thoughts on this, because I have a little bit of a rant every time I hear somebody talking about Legionellas. But tell, tell me what we need to know, Chris. Well, um, legally, because uh, it is a legal thing, you need to have a risk assessment done. Um, so... I'll take a step back. What is Legionella's first? It's bacteria in, in, that grows in water, particularly stagnant water. Um, it can infect you if, it, if the water gets into a bit of an aerosol, which could be from a shower head, could be from a hose. There's quite an interesting case of someone getting Legionella's from a hose. Um, and then you breathe in the water droplets. It infects your lungs. You end up with something that's a bit like pneumonia. And because it gives various different symptoms, sometimes a bit hard to diagnose. So quite often people having contracted it die, which isn't great. Mm. So legally you need to have a risk assessment done, but it doesn't, I think 
perhaps in the past, when this first was um, earmarked, that people got a little bit overexcited and did a massive, great big um, plan to cope with Legionella in a house. You need to have a risk assessment on file. The likely action that is required from that is that if you've got an empty property, you need to flush your, your water system before anybody reoccupies it. Mm. That's probably the extent of what needs to be done mm. for most standard houses. Mm. But you must have the risk assessment and it must be reviewed. Okay, this is where I'm going to have my little bit of a rant. I'll have my rant and then you can tell me that I'm wrong. So my perspective of this is that Legionella, Legionnaire's disease, I remember as a teenager hearing about Legionella's when it's kind of like first discovered. And I remember there was a convention in the States, I forget where, but it was like in a big hotel, mm. probably in Vegas or somewhere. And there was a load of old soldiers and some of them became ill because they were, uh, they were infected by the air conditioning system, as I remember it. And that was why it was called Legionnaires, because there's all these old soldiers who suddenly got this mystery illness, which was later called Legionnaires disease. So when I'm told that my little terraced house just outside Nottingham needs to have a Legionella assessment, I kind of roll my eyes because I think, what are the chances of somebody actually catching Legionnaire's disease from a shower in one of my rented properties? Probably very, very slim. Is it ever really going to happen? And is it just one more thing which somebody's sort of come up with some regulations around? Well, I suppose um, if you've got a cold water tank in your loft and it's summertime mm. and you've got nobody in the property, then you can have Legionella bacteria nicely growing in that water tank, particularly if it's not covered. Um, so you've now got Legionella in your water tank, then mm. the first person that grabs a shower mm. could well be exposed to it. So mm. there's the risk. There is a risk. I suppose what I'm saying is, though, that it's not something that you actually hear about happening, or maybe we just don't recognise it's Legionnaire's disease when people get ill. It's, 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 you're more likely to catch a common cold, aren't you? Well, definitely. But, you know, um, the regulations are there to protect people. Yes. Uh, and whether you have a particular opinion on whether the health and safety executive go completely over the top in this country or more, are more officious than uh, they are in other countries, well, you know, that, that, that you may have a valid point. Um, there's the laws. You're supposed to protect your tenants, and that's one of the things that you, sh you should be looking at. And I, and I can see that. And actually, although I have a rant, I am also very compliant. So anybody <laughs> listening to this, yes, of course. And my managing agents get in touch with me periodically and say, the Legionella assessment is due on such and such a property. And I roll my eyes, but we still do it, and I still pay my agents to get it done, just in case anybody's wondering. But it's just one of those things which I do wonder, actually, whether it's a bit OTT, and there's other things we could actually be checking for, which are maybe more likely to harm our tenants. But there we go. So going back to this then, getting back on track, how do we actually comply with this legislation then? Well, and what does the assessment actually mean and, and how often do we need to do it? Well, yes, you need an assessment. It helps the assessor if you've got a drawing of how the water systems are laid out on your property. But I suspect most people haven't got a drawing. Yes. Um, they should come in and give you a risk assessment. Uh, and commonly, a domestic house will be of, of low risk. Um, the biggest risk is probably having a, an unsealed water tank in your loft. Okay. That's probably the biggest risk uh, and to alleviate the risk. If it's empty, flush it, the whole system through before you um, start um, putting new tenants in. Okay, so I'm, I'm a tenants moving in. When shall I get this done? Well, I'll get it done before. I'll get it done now. <laughs> get it done before they move in. Yeah, definitely. Al along with the, the gas safety test and, and whatever. Okay, fine. And I think just thinking back to the beginning of this interview, Chris, you also talked about PAT testing? Yes. What, do, what does PAT actually stand for? Portable appliance testing. It's a okay. Since it's now, since the last amendment, a little bit misleading because it does include things that are secured to the wall. Right, so, so not, not necessarily portable. Not necessarily portable. Um, so you've got a portable appliance. Let's take a kettle um, and you've got a tenant moving in. You've provided the kettle. You should make sure that it's safe. Um, in going and checking if the, the appliance is safe, we do a number of physical checks, uh, physical inspections, and a number of tests. So just to run you through those as to what, um, what, what needs to be checked, we'd firstly look at the plug, look at the fuse, see if there's any signs of thermal damage there, which should indicate that there's a problem with the, the wiring. 
but also look along the whole length of the flex to see if there's any necks, scrapes, breaks in it and we'd look at the, how that plug terminates into the kettle itself. We'd then run a couple of tests to make sure that the earthing system for the kettle works correctly and the insulation is okay between the cables. So that's kind of all the, everything that needs to be done. But um, behind that, there's a whole load of, of, of records that need to be kept. So you need to have a register of any appliances you've left in the property. That's, they need to have a unique identifying label on them. You need to have a record of inspection of tests that have been carried out. Um, you need to have a rep repair register, a register of faulty equipment, and the previous test results made available to people. So there's a whole load of stuff really there. That, um, kind of needs to be covered. <laughs> right. Well, I'm not going to have another rant, but I'm sitting here thinking it's probably quicker and cheaper just to buy a new kettle every year, isn't it? Uh, well, you've got a very good point there that new new items typically don't need to be inspected for or inspected yearly, but tested every two years. So yes, it may be easier just to buy buy new equipment or just not leave your tenant with any portable appliances that you supplied. Yeah, absolutely. So this is another argument for going unfurnished if you can. But of course, depending upon which market we're in, it might be expected that we leave appliances, and particularly white goods are going to come into this. So mm. things like the washing machine, the fridge freezer, whatever, are going to need to be tested on a regular basis. So what are we looking at every year if, if they're not new? Well, in a rental property, it's normally an inspection every year and inspection test every two years. Okay. So the inspection is different from the inspection and test in, in what way? That would literally just be looking at the flex and the cables and the plug, yep. as opposed to sticking Pl something on it to make sure you're not going to get an electric charge from it. Plug, it. plug it into a pat tester and testing that the earth continuity, that sounds complicated, but that if there's a fault, it will use the earth cable to get rid of the fault works correctly and that the insulation between the cables is OK. OK. So um, that's what the, the pat testing kit does. And that's the two-year test. The inspection should be done yearly. Right. But so is that useful to note? So an inspection yearly, an inspection and test every two years. Yeah. I mean, the, there are a number of responsibilities that are put onto everyone, really, because the user has a responsibility too. So your tenant should, if they see something, you know, if they see a big cut in the flex, they should be telling you mm. that um, you know this is potentially dangerous. Mm. If they don't tell you, they've sort of negated their responsibilities. Mm. But it's probably something that landlords and property investors don't quite do, and they should do, is tell the tenants, you've got the responsibilities for this kit as well, and mm. if there's something wrong, you need to tell me. Mm. Um, we are talking a second ago about inspection testing guidance, uh, uh, frequency, sorry. There is a guidance document on the Health and Safety, Safety Executive website but log on, go onto my Facebook page, you'll be able to pick it up from there. Um, and also I put a little bit on there about duty holders' responsibilities, which you can kind of copy and paste and give to your tenants so that they know their responsibilities as well. Okay, so very practical question, maybe a silly question, but who's actually doing the PAT test? Is it me as the landlord or do I get somebody in to do it for uh, me? We're back into that competent person thing, aren't we, where yes, you could do it, but if you mess it up, you're going to have to prove to somebody that you are competent and skilled at doing it. Now, I think as a, a number of the landlord associations offer a PAT testing training, um, which would be great. PAT testers themselves, the, the kit to do the testing, come in a whole range of uh, price spectrum. Mm. So my one cost me a thousand pounds, but I think you can pick them up for a hundred or a couple of hundred quid. Mm. Obviously, they're a different beast. Mm. Um, so I think you, you could well be capable of doing it yourself. Although when I did my property training, one of the things that did stick with me was that I was told that I should um, be looking for properties and looking for money. Perhaps becoming a pack tester isn't really the property investor's journey, perhaps. But you know, that's mm. up to each individual person. Well, <laughs> you've already quoted Rob Moore a few times, and of course, Life Leverage, which is Rob's book, which was about outsourcing as much as we can to free up our time to do the important stuff, would probably suggest that we should probably get somebody in to do it for us anyway. Mm. So best leave the expert stuff to the experts is what I think. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, Chris, that's been really, really helpful. Anybody listening to this, I'm sure if they didn't know about CDM now, they now know everything that they need, they need to know. Perhaps a very quick summary for us as property investors who are, who are doing refurbs. Quick bullet points. 
what should we think about, particularly with the CDM? The most important point, I think, for you is to make sure you appoint a writing uh, principal designer, principal contractor. That's, that's the absolute key thing, isn't it? Appoint absolute. your contractor in writing. And then the second thing you have to do is make sure they're doing the job. Um, like I said, on my Facebook page, I'll put up some links. There's a six-page short summary which just deals with what your responsibilities would be. Yeah. That's really helpful. And I'll, I'll put a link in there for the 90-page document. If you want a copy, just, you can just put your email address in and I'll whiz you over a PDF of all okay. those details. Okay. Facebook aside, how, how can listeners contact you if they want to talk about not just this, but the, the electrical regs and all the other stuff that we've spoken about when, when you've come to visit us? Well, um, you can pop on my web uh, page, hectorselectrics.co.uk. You can contact me by email, which is chris at hectorselectrics.co.uk, or Facebook. So I'm, I'm available 24-7. <laughs> Fantastic. Might not get an answer 24-7, <laughs> but <laughs> you can certainly push me a question. Brilliant. Well, Chris, thank you ever so much for coming in. Thank you for coming all the way down here to, to give us that information. It's absolutely crucial. I realise it's a very technical subject, but we need to know the technical stuff to make sure, particularly, that we're on the right side of the law. And heaven forbid that nobody does get hurt or get ill in our properties, which has obviously got to be a great thing. So thank you ever so much, Chris. I've been Peter Jones. Uh, this has been the Pro Progressive Property Podcast. If you have any ideas for any subjects you'd like to cover, let me know. Get in touch with me via Messenger or put a message through the Progressive Property Facebook group. If it looks like a subject which could benefit all of us, we may do a podcast on it. In the meantime, here's to successful property investing.